<laughs> uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Aaron Bobbick. I'm the dean of the McKelvey School of Engineering. And it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here on multiple accounts. Uh, one, it's a pretty cool lecture series, and this format is really interesting, where if someone gets to give uh, three lectures uh, around a domain. Uh, and, uh, and I'm really quite excited to, to see today's lecture. Uh, the other way in which it's just really cool is that I'm here introducing Ian Bogus, and I'm introducing him, and he's a faculty member at Wash U. See, Ian and I, we've known each other now somewhere around 15 years. Uh, he got to Georgia Tech uh, mid-2000s, 2004 you said? Yeah. yeah. And uh, I was there, I got there in 99. I was in a college of computing, we didn't have departments. And Ian was in a department which at the time was called Literature, Culture, and Communication. It's now Literature, uh, Media, and Communication, because culture is obviously irrelevant. Um, <laughs> so, uh, we were, so, so a couple things. One is, uh, at the time I, I was helping run this center called the GVU Center, Graphics, Visualization, and Usability, which was really about the intersection between computing and the outside world, all right? So computer science you can think of as being about what goes on inside the box. The GVU Center, which later became its own department of interactive computing, was about the interface between computing and the outside world. And that interface could be, uh, we were talking before, student about HCI, so it could be in involving interaction with human beings. And so uh, we had a very significant HCI group. Uh, it could be uh, understanding the outside world, so we had a computer vision group. It could be pushing on the outside world, so you had robotics, right? So it was at this interface. But one of the really cool things about connecting with uh, people like Ian over in this weird department called LCC is that there was this question of how does the nature of computing impact the way people essentially think about things and manipulate the things about which they think, right? And underlying a lot of it was the notion fundamentally of story, right? If you think of story as this sort of weird method of organizing a, a way of thinking, right? Then the, the you know story has evolved over millennia, and what's been always interesting is how does the various technologies that we have allow us to rethink about story? One of uh, Ian's colleagues uh, at LCC, uh, uh, Janet Murray, wrote this pretty cool book, uh, Hamlet on the Holodeck, uh, which some of you may have read, um, and she made it, what was the obvious point, but it wasn't obvious until you read it for me, you know, that before the printing press, there were no novels. I mean, who would write that by hand, right? You know, you know a dime store novel, but it just wouldn't make sense. There were, there were a couple of epic poems, you know, Beowulf and things like that, but you didn't have, you didn't have the novel as sort of a story form, okay? So fast forward, what was the printing press? Somebody here must know. <laughs> 15 something, what was it? 1463. See, I knew what it was. 14, what? 63. 63, I knew he was. Okay. Gutenberg Bible, right? Anyway. So, fast forward about 500 years actually. And now you have computing systems which allow you to think about story and interaction with a story in a way that's way more active something that would respond, something that could drive you in a particular way, or you could engage with, uh, et cetera. And sort of what was born out of that was this notion of thinking about this intersection between computing, story, you're engaging with a story, and you're engaging with a story, you know, one word for that might be play, right? How do you think about this, you know, this way of, uh, of engagement? And so Ian uh, came to uh, uh, Georgia Tech from UCLA, and we had this really cool interaction between computing folks and essentially story folks. All right. And in fact, uh, he was uh, very significant in the development of something that we call the computational media undergraduate degree, which in you know, a lot of places were creating gaming degrees. And gaming degrees are fine, we'll get you jobs, but they sort of miss the point, which is this notion of making media computational gives you the possibility of thinking about story, thinking about engagement, in different ways, of which gaming was one segment. And, uh, and Ian was you know, fundamental to that. Uh, Joe, I know, talked about in his introduction about all the great writing. 
that Ian has done, so I won't uh, bore you with those details. Although I will say that I opened up my week. I don't know if anybody gets the week. It's this quick summary, et cetera. And there on the bottom is a little thing from The Atlantic written by Ian, so, so he's a big deal. Um, but uh, so, you know, he, he's a writer, he's a scholar, but lest anyone doubt it, he's also an incredible geek. <laughs> okay? I watched, he, uh, so I used to teach this course on uh, low level uh, media architecture. And Ian came in and he gave a lecture to store to people about what games were. And I watched him on the fly from a blank editor code a game. I don't know if you remember this. It was, it was, it was you know, it was first like, can we draw a color line? You know, and they said, what? And, and he said, well, and, and we were, and by the way, we had no library. So you didn't say like line from here to here. You actually had to like write into the memory locations to get the color. Okay, so that's the. Well, once you can do a color line, well, now I can do lots of lines. So he wrote that and, you know, ran it. And, you know, and it makes all the errors on the fly. I don't remember if it was C or Python, but whatever it was. And then the idea was, well, you know, there are a whole bunch of games where basically they're Twitch games, right? Can you press the button at the right time? So he we said, well, what if we put up a color and your goal was to make sure you'd hit a button as these lines scroll by and you'd get the right color. And if you got it, you know, a nice noise would go off. And an hour and 20 minutes later, the students had been taken through the process of going from a blank canvas to an operational video game. And for them to see that direct capacity, the direct capability, was truly amazing. And to do it, you needed someone who not only had some understanding of what does it mean to engage someone in a game, you know, but at the end of the day, knew where to put the semicolons <coughs> and you know, make it work. And uh, so I, uh, I can't. It, Fang Shang talked about it, Dean Hu talked a little bit about it, about how excited we were to be able to uh, liberate him from Georgia Tech uh, and to bring him here. And so please uh, welcome uh, what I think is one of our great scholars, uh, Ian Bogus. to be on to do the lecture or you can't even do it all right so now I'm on um, I, I'm really honored to have, to have been invited to to deliver the lecture I hope you have had as much uh, fun as as I have um, and if you're chuckling that's because you were here for some of the earlier lectures and it starts to kind of mess with your head a little bit doesn't it um, okay, let me do just a quick recap of where we've been um, for those who didn't see last week's episode. Um, on Monday, I offered a theory of play and fun and games that was based on externalizing those concepts into things rather than holding them fast inside of subjects. And uh, Wednesday, which was just yesterday, which is incredible to me, uh, we talked about how difficult it, it can be to stop blaming ourselves for failing to accomplish that attention, um, or even appraising ourselves for, for succeeding at it. And today's talk, today's talk is the hardest one. It's the, it's the topic I've struggled with the most since I've started working on play because it is one thing to theorize about it or to understand it uh, philosophically, and it's really quite another to put play in practice, in real life. How even do you do it? So two winters ago, next February, I took a trip to Southern California with my daughter. And in fact, until I had boarded that plane, um, uh, when I boarded that plane, it was the last time I was on an aircraft until I, uh, I got on a plane to conduct my home inspection when I moved here uh, to St. Louis uh, this, this summer. So it's been a, a long time. I'm usually on planes quite a bit. Uh, and that last flight, that one uh, all those uh, months ago, 
It was almost as if it was offering a kind of personalized diagnosis of the pandemic catastrophe uh, that was to come, because the trip itself was, was something of a disaster uh, for us, especially the part of it that involved airplanes. Uh, first, we got delayed uh, for four hours outbound from Atlanta. I don't really remember why uh, that, that was. And then on the return trip, which was already a late night flight, uh, things went uh, even more haywire. Uh, we started at the John Wayne Airport uh, in Orange County. I purchased a large bag of unholy snacks called Skittles Dips, which is Skittles coated in yogurt, my friends. And uh, I also bought a copy of, uh, of Uncanny Valley, uh, Anna Weiner's memory about uh, working, memoir about uh, working in uh, Silicon Valley. And so I was like fully prepared to work the materials of the material world uh, on this flight. Uh, and the flight took off, and we sat there and the plane hurtled us through the air at three quarters the speed of sound, which was a marvel that we didn't notice or remark upon. Food, uh, or the in-flight simulation of food, was provisioned. And I remember, I remember vividly in, in that moment on that flight recalling, thanks to the food, a previous flight I'd taken back to California from the East Coast more than two decades earlier when I was a comparative literature a graduate student. I was uh, impoverished and lacking airline status, and so I was seated way at the back uh, of the plane. And by the time uh, the food arrived, the choice of chicken or pasta had been collapsed into a default choice of pasta or pasta because the chicken had been depleted. And, and this, this is so embarrassing to talk about this, it, it struck my then completely theory-addled a brain uh, in this moment. This, this, I thought, offered the perfect object lesson in Benedict Spinoza's pantheism, uh, articulated through the, the premise Deus siwe natura, God or nature, in which we find siwe, that weird and understated Latin conjunction that indicates this or that, but you know, either one, it doesn't really matter which. God is nature, nature is God for Spinoza. The two are interchangeable, chicken or pasta or either. You take what you can get, which is an airline meal. And now you don't even get that, right? You just get nullus siwe nihil. <laughs> anyway, um, I should mention as an aside now that I, I elected to make this lecture longer than the previous ones, because I figured I had you now. You were coming for the reception. <laughs> we're starting at 6. Nobody had to be anywhere, so just strap in. <laughs> OK, our flight began its descent into Atlanta in the usual way. It overshot the Hartsfield-Jackson Airport and executed the standard wide counterclockwise turn to enter the approach queue. Uh, but then. Then it didn't. It stopped. The jet turbines wind up, and we started rising fast and turning to the north. Something was clearly wrong. But it wasn't even anything interesting that was wrong. Regional weather had just created backups that necessitated an air traffic hold in Atlanta. And while our aircraft had fuel sufficient to wait out the hold, we didn't have enough fuel to have waited it out because commercial airliners are required to maintain a minimum reserve. So we got diverted to Chattanooga to refuel. And as with many problems, the problem wasn't in the problem so much as the weird fuzzy boundary around the problem. And the explanation that I just gave you only arrived after the passengers began vibrating in, in panic, you know, with something mechanically wrong? Would they miss their connections and become stranded? Would the granola bar that they had ingested two hours earlier fuel the human vessels inside the aluminum one? These were all matters on our mind. We landed successfully and refueled in Chattanooga, and that part of the process took longer than anyone might have hoped uh, or predicted. If you just sit and wait and watch a plane refuel next time you go to the airport, it takes a really long time. And by now it was really quite late, but we were ready to go, except we weren't. Chattanooga is a small airport, and it just wasn't used to receiving Boeing 757s. And it turned out that nobody knew how to disconnect the taxi tow bar from this particular aircraft, except one guy 
who had long since gone home for the day and lived 40 minutes away and was driving back right now through the sleet. Hysteria erupted in the cabin. <laughs> you could hear the passengers calling hotels ready to abandon ship, but the weather problems had already filled all the nearby lodging with throngs of locally stranded travelers. I looked into renting a car and driving the two hours back to Atlanta, but the car rentals were also picked over. The lots were going to close soon already. And you know it just made the whole thing too big a risk. And, and it was a risk that would have begat ever more risks, too. I would have to have somehow piloted the car safely through the ice and stayed awake while doing so. But even so, exploring all those options helped us identify the best one, or, or at least the one that we chose, which was to do nothing and just to sit there in our airplane seats, which is what airplane seats are for. Eventually, we got home eight hours later than we had expected to, and afterward, our lives continued minimally changed by the affair. In the previous lecture, I tried to persuade you that creative practice doesn't arise from the intrinsic self, as if fueled by the molten core of one's personality, but rather that that output comes from a negotiation between a creator, some initial vision or context, and a set of material limitations that help lead the idea from abstraction to concreteness. Creativity, in other words, is always found under conditions. To seek the novelty that births meaning, you have to embrace those conditions rather than rejecting them. And that's already hard. You know, writing a book or painting a painting or parenting a child is no mean feat on its own. But at least those are feats that normally or often enjoy recognition as such. It's much harder to recognize the more mundane circumstances we find ourselves in most of the time as ones where both creativity and constraint operate such as negotiating the dumb reality of a flight delay. And yet those kinds of experiences are far more plentiful circumstances than the traditionally creative ones, the ones we think of as creative, the ones where we want to spend our time and our energy. My daughter who was with me on that plane was, and, and she, she still is, the same daughter who more than a dozen years earlier had danced among the mall tiles, which those of you who have attended the previous lectures will recognize by now. She was a high school senior now, and we'd gone to Southern California scouting colleges. She was interested in an acting conservatory program, but specifically in screen acting, which doesn't really exist as a program of study anywhere, an opportunity perhaps for another university to take up. So for example, we visited Chapman University, which has a stellar film and television uh, production facility with multiple sound stages and Foley stages and, and theaters, and then a theater program sort of crammed into the forgotten basement of an ancient hall. Uh, while we were there, Nico Skordakis gave us a campus tour, and uh, he related the fact that given the high personal and financial cost of medical residency and fellowship, He'd recently settled on dentistry as a, sex, a, a, a sensible successor to his biology major, which is a playground no less than any other. We visited USC, my alma mater, and also home to a stellar cinema program and also a, well, an extant stage acting program that the cinema program uh, completely ignores because it has a relationship with SAG-AFTRA anyway. So things were feeling a little bleak. My daughter was a good and a conscientious student, but never a terribly willing one. The traditional four-year residential college experience, which is, of course, the product that we sell here at Wash U, and which her older brother had partaken of with glee at an institution not quite as august as ours, but no less expensive, and which America clings to as a structuring force even for those who will never have access to it, this experience was just never really of interest to her anyway. 
it was hard to see a match between her desires and capacities and the structures and expectations the world had placed before her. And at the same time, those structures and expectations represented the very pinnacle of privilege, as they do for everyone in this room today. The world is really just a world, isn't it? So rather than engaging with this question directly, we spent two days at Disneyland instead, uh, an act that would later seem extremely prescient given the lockdown that emerged soon after and that still persists uh, to some degree. A and then we sat on an airplane for 13 hours. The day after my daughter and I finally returned home that February, I opened my email to find a note from a young woman of a similar age in a similar position, but this time I was circumscribed in her situation. I recently read your book, Play Anything, and damn, what a book she opened, which like, this is the kind of email you want to get. I was totally listening, you know? <laughs> the idea of getting out of your head and doing things for themselves sounded really great, she continued. So I tried to put it to practice. And on the bright side, I did succeed, turning brushing and getting ready and my night routine and traffic into play. It worked, and I'm having fun. I used to hate waking up, and now it's a game, yada, yada. At this point, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. So I keep reading. But now I tried this for my college work. Before, when I'd start studying, I'd get really uncomfortable and seek some desperate distraction, which I'm sure none of us have ever experienced. So now, your book said, treat the thing for what it is, with absurd respect, which is something I also told you this week. But I don't understand, she continued, how I should conjure this feeling of respect on demand. Like, when I'm going, oh, what a bummer, physics, how do I get myself to feel respect? Did I understand what you said about respect in the wrong way? Or should I forget all feelings and start with the constraints and magic circle part? Or is there something I'm missing here? She signed the note, thank you, Thalia, 18. So I was completely addled, but primed by this week of thinking about, but not necessarily making much progress on a similar concern with my own daughter. And the whole moment felt completely surreal, as if it had been lifted from a screenplay. But I set out to respond, because of course I was going to. I won't pretend to have some kind of a magic formula for this, I began. And indeed, I think one of the problems is believing in magical formulas or numbered lists of foolproof methods or whatnot. Now keep that in mind, because we're going to come back to that weakness of mine in a bit. I'm going to keep it warm in your mind. I continued. One of the things I try to get at in the book, I expressed to Thalia, is that when you try to build an activity solely from your own desires and feelings, it ends up becoming weaker and less stable. Our minds are just poor foundations for action, at least taken alone, I wrote. So you're probably unlikely to conjure respect for physics just by willing it in your head. But then I struggled to find tractable advice. One answer, I surmised, would be to search her mind for worldly things that might start to make physics something she could take seriously. But that's rather the opposite of the sentiment I had just expressed about why the mind alone was an insufficient constraint for circumscribing a playground. At this point, I began to worry that I didn't even know what I was talking about. Respect doesn't mean fealty, I finally wrote. It's not as if physics got it right and Thalia got it wrong. Respect really means treating things for what they are and not trying to change them to match your preconceptions. Physics is physics, and there's not much one can do about it. Sure, yes, of course, perhaps there are examples that might make the material clearer, or study methods that might be more tractable. It's probably worth exploring those, I suggested to Thalia, but it's also worth recognizing that physics might not be a thing you will ever enjoy doing for whatever reason. I'm sorry if there are physicists in the room. Is there a physicist in the house? Uh, but I, I advise Thalia to consider powering through 
her physics in the least possible time and with the lowest possible effort. If she were studying to be an engineer or a scientist, then eventually Thalia might have to come to terms with her trials with physics in order to thrive in a career. But if not, then you know, maybe it would be fine not to worry about it too much. The point here, I told Thalia, is that it's not physics that demands respect, but the specific system that is her and physics, the playground that incorporates Thalia and physics and other participants undisclosed in a brief email that she sent to a stranger. The confluence of her interests, abilities, and predilections merged with topics and entities and things in the world produced different and unique opportunities for action. The constraints don't operate just in physics or in studying or in time management or whatever. They are also in Thalia and in her schedule and in everything else around her. Recognizing the actors in that system and developing approaches to living within them, that's the purpose of play. Constraints aren't there for you to overcome or even to like. First, they are simply there to acknowledge and eventually perhaps to learn to tolerate. And, and that's a kind of respect too. During yesterday's lecture, I showed you the problem that thinking outside the box presents. It withholds a secret about the circumstances at play, and then it penalizes the player for not having correctly divined those circumstances, casting the result as conformity rather than duplicity. And instead of doing that, we explored the idea of the magic circle, which I sort of renamed the playground for you, as a way to circumscribe the materials at play. And that circumscription both defined a boundary and contained its contents. But it's easy to forget one of those materials, and an important one at that. You. You are also one of the terms in the game. Circumscribing a set of limitations always implicates you within it. My daughter, the younger version of her from the mall, I mean, she seamlessly accepted and put into practice the features of her form and her disposition in that particular context. She knew that she was small, for example, that she had to move quickly in order to keep up with me. She might even have remembered getting lost in a large farmer's market the year before and concluded that clinging fast to me was advisable. She also knew that she was not in control and that she was bored. And all of those features contributed to her invention, the equivalent of the, the chits and dice or the balls and nets in her game. But when Thalia faced a similar circumstance, even after reading my book, it simply didn't occur to her, which is on me, by the way, it simply didn't occur to her to imagine herself as a part of it. The world somehow stopped around her body and mind, and she became just a passenger, like I was on the airplane. The only, or at least the first idea to arise was that something was wrong with her, and that she needed to alter her own capacities to tolerate physics, or even to put this, this theory of play that I provided to use. About a week later, Thalia wrote back to me with her results. Been at it for a week now, and I figured I could use time as my go-to constraint, because all the games have time limits, except games like Monopoly. It was a very, very summative uh, critique of Monopoly right there. <laughs> so to get through physics, I just start my stopwatch, and I see how fast I can do it. Other things that I don't want to rush through, I take my time. In that way, I don't have to worry about how I feel for the task at all. So again, I'm sorry if there are physicists in the room, but I also assure the humanists here that for every Thalia suffering through physics, there is a Thea struggling to tolerate literature. My point isn't that physics isn't worth spending time on, but that the most productive approach for Thalia in the then present moment might have involved shirking it. Two months later, as the college acceptance deadlines loomed, my daughter came into my bedroom with an idea. Having talked with all the programs about their fall plans, she felt unconvinced that an acting conservatory program would be possible 
or at least normal enough to be worthwhile during the pandemic. And this turned out to be very much correct. Furthermore, she was already worried about a four-year academic program and all its coverage requirements. I don't want to spend a bunch of money and time and end up not finishing, she told me. At, at this point, I should add that my daughter has very much inherited my tendency toward brutal but somewhat absurdist realism. This is a, a text message she sent to the family uh, chat last night, and she's, she's kind of vaguely aware that I'm, I'm, I'm doing these lectures, but I'm sure she's not following along from home. And, and the caption reads, you see the picture of dinner. Dinner looks like something from a Disney animated short about a guy who's depressed until he meets a quirky pineapple that teaches him the joy in the mundane or something. <laughs> like, yikes. Okay, back to her college story, though. So there was an alternative. She had been taking dual enrollment classes at Georgia State University already, and those courses would count toward a degree were she to matriculate there. Uh, no, they can also transfer, but we had learned from my older son, who also attended GSU as a high school dual enrollment student, that transfer credit is a crapshoot because other instit institutions might count it for graduation, but not toward uh, requirements, which makes it less useful. And this is one of those sort of secret college logistics things that you only learn about after it's too late. It's a sort of dot problem game played with real money and real time. <laughs> Anyway, my daughter reasoned, why not cash out her banked credits, go full time during the pandemic summer, and then just try to get through, you know, and then move to a new city where she could focus on getting acting work or trying to. So one pandemic summer became two, of course, which only accelerated the acceleration. Uh, she did another full summer term of courses, and then uh, moved to Manhattan when we moved here. And she got cast as a lead in a short film that shot last month, and she'll graduate next month, and she's, she's sort of doing her thing. Now, you might observe correctly that one can't replace a four-year college experience with two done largely at home over Zoom. And that's true. But nevertheless, you can do the latter instead of the former given different circumstances and different desires, especially this year. And I don't mean to make prognostications here about the future of education. I don't think an offering such as ours is in danger of falling out of favor. In fact, I wrote a whole feature for The Atlantic last year on the lasting power of the college experience. I'm just telling you a story about how one person made choices in one situation by taking into account as many of the properties of that situation that she could admit to herself were present given the current circumstances. On Monday, I introduced you to Ironoia, my name for the mistrust of things, which I characterized as a widespread cultural illness. I distinguished Ironoia from paranoia because the latter is a distrust of people and their motivations. But one can be ironoid of people, too, and their distinguishing features. There's, there's nothing dehumanizing about noting that our own predilections and talents and weaknesses and circumstances also facilitate and constrain our nature and possibilities. But all too often, we reject those limitations, sometimes out of shame or embarrassment, sometimes from brute ignorance and sometimes under the presumption that those limitations are merely temporary inconveniences, soon overcome by grit or resilience or whatever horrific pop psychological concept currently circulates. Which leads me, unfortunately, to Martin Heidegger. The philosopher Ian Thompson has devoted much of his career to an interpretation of education as a process of Heideggerian disclosure. What a thing or person is and does depends on their context, and that context is all-inclusive, covering the material circumstances of its creation, its operation, and its decay, along with the social, political, and economic circumstances that it finds itself within. 
Thompson cites Heidegger on this in what turns out to be an uncharacteristically lucid line. To learn means to make everything we do and allow answer to whatever essentials address us at a given time. I mean, clear for Heidegger anyway. As people thrown into the world, what Heidegger calls Dasein, we are constantly contending with the process of world disclosure. Thompson, following a long line of philosophers who focused on the utility of disclosure as a compass bearing for personal and social action, takes that goal as fundamental to education. As selves, we disclose our own being by becoming who we are. And as educators, we help others come into their own, as Thompson puts it. To be yourself is to be you, but even more so. By learning to disclose being, Thompson writes, we human beings learn to come authentically into our own. But how do we know when we are authentically coming into our own? Authenticity is just a messy problem these days. As a kind of received cultural value, it often gets contrasted with social pressure. To be oneself is to refuse to conform to expectations set externally. You know, just being my authentic self, someone might post on Instagram. The problem is, external expectations, among many other things, are not so easily separable from a sense of self. The things one thinks to think, let alone do, get structured by the circumstances surrounding them. Those materials are also circumscribed by any playground we might erect. The disconnect between our nature and our knowledge of that nature infects authenticity as a concept. Being authentic tends to involve an ideal of oneself rather than that self's reality. Thus, to say that I'm just being my authentic self becomes less a historical record and more of an aspiration. You know, here is a depiction of how I long to represent myself, at least for now. Let me show you what I mean. As I was preparing for these lectures, I had a passing conversation about them with my film and media studies colleague, colleague Colin Burnett, who's, I think, here tonight. Colin, are you here in the room? There he is. There's Colin. Colin Burnett, everyone. I'd just like the record to show that Colin knows that I'm relating this exchange to you, so I'm not betraying any confidences. I had noted to Colin that I was slightly anxious about this lecture series because it was clearly also going to function as a kind of test. This is, in some ways, a coming out party in which I get to show this, my new intellectual and work community, a little bit about how I think. And in turn, in which you get to judge me based on how how I think matches how you think. Or, how you think I should think, or what you think I think about how you think, or any other number of permutations along those lines. Anyway, I mentioned this sensation of being tested to Colin, and now to you. And later that night, Colin, who is a, a thoughtful person whom I admire for that trait, sent me an email recalling some of the conversations in the interview process that led to my appointment. And part of it read, you will recall that a few people asked you questions about how you position yourself in the current academic field. This was a conversation behind the scenes as well. How does Bogus view the current field? And how does this work affect his thinking? If it doesn't, what do we think about that? Now friends, I promise you I am not spinning a yarn when I tell you that I had a literal nightmare about the matter that very night. <laughs> In the dream, I set out to deliver the lectures you are attending at this very moment. But you, the audience, were all occluded from my view on the other side of a wall. I could neither see you nor judge your response, let alone react to it. So there's some real Plato shit going down, right? <laughs> but the wall didn't turn out to matter because I also couldn't get the apparatus through which the presentation was to be delivered to operate. 
And in the dream, that apparatus was represented by the computer, which is a dense symbol for me to be sure. But look, I, I have also read my Freud, and as a metaphor for thought, it's pretty clear that this dream computer also represented my brain and thereby myself. And I was so unable to get that apparatus for the dream presentation working that I had to abandon the lecture entirely. It was simply impossible. And then I woke up. I'm sure this nightmare was also catalyzed by a conversation I had waded into online just a few days prior. One of my last two PhD students at Georgia Tech, Sarah Schumann, graduated this summer, and she took a tenure-track job at the College of Charleston, and I'm very proud of her. She's going back to Georgia Tech to walk for graduation next month, but I won't be there to hood her, which I'm quite sad about. So my former colleague, Ann Sullivan at Georgia Tech, another member of her committee, is doing so. Anyway, Ann had asked about how you borrow regalia for this purpose when you're working at a different university from the one that graduated you, because the regalia looks different. And then another former colleague of mine, Lane Nooney, who's now at NYU, uh, but did her PhD at Stony Brook, wondered, atop that wonder, also, what do you do when the department you got your PhD from no longer exists? <laughs> That's a good question. Some chatter ensued about how one's field uh, uh, establishes the colors and symbology uh, of the regalia, because it's all like medieval stuff. And, uh, and then Lane finally said, funny thing is, I don't really understand what my field was. It was a PhD in cultural studies and theory, and I had been just watching and really trying to bite my tongue this whole time. But now I couldn't help myself and admitted, I have, I have come to understand that some scholars understand what their field is. I wonder what that is like. <laughs> now, I want to make clear that it's not that I am so confident in who I am and how I arrived at my current situation that I feel exempt from the question, somehow above the very idea of fields or disciplines. I assure you that I am not confident in that fact at all. In my mind, there are two kinds of people in the world, those with imposter syndrome and sociopaths. <laughs> and I, I don't think I'm a sociopath. <laughs> but getting back to Colin's useful suggestion, I also don't think that you brought me here to affirm a prior idea about the current academic field, which is a kind of nine dot problem of a name, by the way, but to ask gently, and then to shape what the future might look like, what we ought to do with what we've got, and what we might yet have. I think, and I, I certainly hope, that uh, some comfort with that prospect explains why FMS was interested in bringing me on, and I suspect that Joe Lowenstein's ongoing commitment to interdisciplinary inquiry, not to mention his generous support of my prospects here, explains why he wanted me to address you in this lectureship as well. In that regard, parallel to preparing to deliver these talks, I've been working with Jeremy Cadell in Global Studies, who works on non-digital uh, simulations for education, to find folks doing work on games around campus. And it seems that the people doing this are largely doing so in isolation, uh, but mostly, at least within ANS, in, in the social sciences, or in Olin, or, or, or in engineering. And I don't think any of the folks that Jeremy and others have identified uh, as people we want to kind of get together and, and, and talk to, to about this have attended <laughs> uh, these lectures, which might just mean that they were busy or that we didn't re reach them, or it might mean nothing at all. And I'm not, I'm not complaining about that. I'm just noting the idea, uh, the idea that uh, Burnett first posited about the current academic field assumes the circumscription of a particular playground. You know, a field to whom? But perhaps the most fruitful configuration uh, of materials, or one fruitful configuration, which would really be enough, doesn't exist within a boundary we have yet drawn out. So this is what I mean when I say that authenticity is not some closely held deep and clear position about what someone really knows about themselves. In Heidegger, the word that usually gets translated as authentic is eigentlich, which means something like real or true or actual. 
and in, in our contemporary uh, vernacular, which is what we speak instead of Heideggerian, mercifully, as you might say on Instagram or over after work hot wings, the actual self isn't the same as the authentic one. When you compare them side by side, you know that authenticity is dress up. It's you in you cosplay. But then finding the actual self is harder because not, it not only involves identifying the essential qualities that underlie your own capacities and shortcomings, but also constantly reorienting those properties to all the other people and objects and materials and circumstances that they might encounter. There's just so many playgrounds all swelling and contracting. Thompson, the Heideggerian, puts this in terms of your or my ontological being. That is what it means for us to exist. In each specific situation, we respond ontologically when we learn to discern the inchoate outlines of something that is struggling to emerge into the light of intelligibility and, by giving a name to this emerging phenomenon, we help bring it more fully into being. To be is to become what you are, but more so. Okay, at this point, I want to explicitly step out of the Heidegger sauna because I'm about to make some moves that no Heideggerian would attribute to Heidegger himself. So if there are any Heideggerians in the room, I just ask that you practice deep breathing. If you've been here for the previous lectures, you'll perhaps see why I find some obvious utility in Thompson's move here. To discern the inchoate outlines of something sure feels akin to the circumscription of a playground or a magic circle. Before we can ask what something can do, first we have to know, even provisionally, what it is and in what it is involved. But like, how the hell do we do that, though? That was the question that Thalia first raised, really. How can I see the things with which I might play? And I reminded her that she herself was a part of her own situation. And that worked out, at least for the moment. But that's just one example. For this method to work, for us to be able to live playfully, I can't have to reply to emails from the select few who bother after finding some value in the material to write them. Even the William Morris gnomes and the Igor Stravinskyisms don't really help when it comes to the relatively simpler circumstances of material craft, of physical stuff, which just feels far more straightforward than human nature. Like we, we talked yesterday about how Morris strived to showcase natural materials such as wood. And perceptually, or intellectually, that seems straightforward. Here's some wood. Behold wood. But surfacing the way the surfaces come to be crafted and the playground in which the arts and crafts project coheres is actually quite a bit harder. Like Until you know how the decorative symmetry of a book-matched panel is created from two halves of a ripped lumber board, how would you know to know it? This issue recurs endlessly. Like intellectually, we might know that reading ancient epic in codex form hides the fact that these works were reconstructed from parts for recitation, thanks to the structure of meter and the way that mnemonic devices, such as epithets, slotted into the openings that the meter left. Or we know how the dreamy impressionism of Brassai photographs is accomplished by a fusion of the apparatus, which is a plate film exposed for long durations, and the extremely carefully chosen circumstances in which he made those photographs, namely misty nights that cleared the streets of people and whose environmental moisture acted as a natural diffusion filter. Or how the physical size of the rangefinder camera, which was designed to repurpose tiny cinematic 35 millimeter film, made Cartier-Bresson style decisive moment street photography possible by allowing the photographer to hide the apparatus. Or how this image from the Swiss photographer Robert Franck's pictures of America in the mid-1950s relies on older optical designs 
whose configuration of lens elements and lack of coatings allows more loose reflections of light to bounce around than today's equipment, therefore resulting in more flare, which is what produces that ethereal glow around the jukebox, which is responsible for the image's aesthetic power. You, you almost couldn't make this picture today with modern equipment. Or how the lack of video memory in the 1977 Atari video computer system, a machine that boasted only 128 bytes of RAM, required its programmers to interface with the television picture on a scan line by scan line basis, a necessity of engineering that accidentally produced as a result the broad horizontal bands in, in its game, some aesthetic uh, like these in Barnstormer and some structural uh, like these in Pitfall, uh, which in turn helped make horizontality conventional in video games. These, are, these should be easier examples and they're not. On, on Monday I shared with you the paradox of play, that play is an activity of freedom but that the freedom it affords only arises once the possibilities are reduced rather than expanded. It almost seems like now we face a new paradox inside the paradox. Without visibility of the limitations, their meaning as constraints can never be assumed. Otherwise, as in the nine-dot puzzle I discussed yesterday, it's like playing a game whose rules nobody explained. And you know, there are some answers, like conventions can help, genre in art or material in craft. But even then, the need for enculturation arises, not to mention the inevitable withdrawal of those conventions into the invisible ground of, of custom. And, and the way that uh, Aaron introduced uh, that revelation about the, the novel, which we did not pre-plan, uh, evidences that. I've been tempted over the years to look to the Ulipo, that, that weird collective of creators who invented or, or revived constraints as a, as a way to work through this. You know, you could take something like the palindrome, a text that reads the same backwards uh, and forwards. Uh, this is a 2002 word palindrome called 2002, written by Nick Montfort and William Gillespie. Uh, or, or the lipogram, which is a, a text that omits certain letters such as Georges Perec's novel La Disparition, which is a lipogram in E, a whole novel written without the letter E. Uh, but this, this too seems kind of indulgent. You, you can't just make up new constraints every time the old ones get boring or irritating, like some sort of ludic itinerant. No, er erecting a playground more often involves collecting and reinterpreting existing materials such as those of my daughter in the mall or during the pandemic or Thalia amid her physics homework. Really, only the privileged get to work outside the boundaries of convention amid magic circles made from actual sorcery. Now, if, if, you, if you've looked at your watch, you, you might have started biting your nails a, a bit. It, it sure feels like this lecture is almost over you might be thinking. And Bogost hasn't really given us an answer to the question of how to live playfully. <laughs> Believe me, I am right there with you. <laughs> <laughs> to return to Colin Burnett's provocation about my own predilections and satisfactions, may I admit that I wish I felt satisfied with an answer that could be spun into a pop psychology self-help book, something like, how to Live Playfully, The Seven Proven Steps to Success in Work, Love, Family, and Everything. My literary agent would like me better, too. And ideally, it would be based on a series of small-scale, low-end psychological experiments in the J.P. Guilford vein, which would produce a sufficient journal publications to shift the frame of this work from philosophy to behavioral science. That would be great. And if there are any behavioral scientists in the room, I'm not attacking you. I'm just jealous. <laughs> Now, maybe I'll get over myself and find a way to do that or something like that. But I, I do worry that such a plan can't ever work because play is an aesthetic practice born from an ontological circumstance. And this is why it's easier, for a certain sense of easy anyway, for Ian Thompson to go full metal Heidegger on the problem. In that context, the conversation can end at the abstraction of being. So I'm, I'm jealous of real philosophers, too. 
At one point, Thompson calls his Heideggerian educational practice an ontological midwifery, a process of bringing the beings among us even more into the being of their being, making them even more what they already are. Play isn't a process of invention or of innovation. It's not a divergent thinking that expresses creativity, but a converging one that unearths the elements around which a playground can be erected. The tool we seek here is not a bullet pressing us beyond our current circumstances and into new and better ones, but an auger drilling ever deeper into them. So I don't know if you noticed, but I've tried to model something along the lines of that practice for you today. The process is the practice, and the process involves surfacing and displaying the materials at hand, holding them in our hands, smiling and furrowing at them, but above all, being brutally, mercilessly honest about what it is we've dug up and what those relics and what that refuse suggests we might do under the circumstances under the circumstances. There's a phrase that ought to get more respect than it does. It's always used with a tone of concession and disgust. Well, you did what you could under the circumstances. As if there is ever anything other than the circumstances. Which circumstances were you hoping for? The ideal ones you imagined in your fantasy of your authentic self? Wouldn't it be better to acknowledge and respond to the actual circumstances, even when seeking to improve them or one's lot in relation to them, than to lament them or to reject them or to ignore them. The circumstances, it turns out, are all we ever get. Thank you very much. All right.